Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think we can get started. It's a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Warren Brown. Warren received his Harvard PhD in 2002 with a mix of studies on spectro spectrograph design, the structure of the galactic halo, and extragalactic astronomy. He then led surveys of the galactic halo, which resulted in the discovery of hypervelocity stars, for which he received the department's Bach Prize. And he built and commissioned IR and optical cameras for the MMT. In the course of the hypervelocity star survey, he identified a fascinating group of white dwarf stars that provide insights into the evolution of wide binary systems. Today, he will discuss this new class of white dwarfs, how they probe galactic structure, and their uses in planned gravitational wave detectors. Take it away, Warren. All right. So, welcome, everyone. The second colloquium of the year. It's a shame we can't be in person, but it's good to be together again. Uh, my talk today is about two terms not commonly seen together, gravitational waves and white dwarf binaries. The story I wanna tell you today is that white dwarf binaries promise to be among the most scientifically rich sources we can observe with both light and gravitational waves. So historically, the field of astronomy is based on light. We take for granted that different wavelengths of light probe different phenomena. And the image you see in the background here is the created from the Gaia point source catalog. It essentially shows you the distribution of the billion brightest stars in the sky, because stars mostly emit optical light and Gaia is an optical instrument. But we're entering an era when astronomy has an entirely new form of measurement gravitational waves. And so I'll begin this talk with a brief discussion of gravitational waves and LISA, a future gravitational wave observatory that will detect lots of white dwarf binaries. I'll then talk about our targeted optical survey for white dwarf binaries and what we're learning from that. And I'll close with some ways that we can combine optical and gravitational wave measurements in the future. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators in this work, uh, especially Malcolm Ingo. All right, gravitational waves. So these are a general relativistic effect, ripples in space-time caused by accelerating massive objects, such as two black holes orbiting very close to one another. Notably, gravitational waves link directly to a fundamental quantity that light does not directly measure, which is mass. So let's quantify that. What's referred to is the you know, amplitude of a gravitational wave is written as the fractional distortion of a fiducial length, delta L over L, and is traditionally called the dimensionless strain, H. And as you can see, the strain is related to the gravitational wave frequency, the binary chirp mass, which is a combination of the component masses, the distance to the source, linearly, and in the twiddle, uh, inclination and polarization terms. So the frequency of the gravitational wave you measure is twice the inverse orbital period of the binary, which means that just as different wavelengths of light probe different phenomena, different frequencies of gravitational wave probe different classes of objects and orbital separations. So this, is, this plot illustrates the gravitational wave spectrum, ranging from kilohertz on the left to nanohertz frequencies on the right. And this has suddenly become relevant because LIGO, the ground-based gravitational wave observatory, started directly detecting merging pairs of stellar mass black holes five years ago. LIGO has also detected merging black hole neutron star and double neutron star binaries. LIGO sees these classes of objects because it observes at kilohertz frequencies or millisecond orbital timescales. At the other end of the gravitational wave spectrum, at nanohertz frequencies, pulsar timing rays can detect objects with much larger orbital separations. You know, using the time delays between a whole network of pulsars, you can detect pairs of supermassive black holes merging together. 
in between is almost everything else. And what's relevant for this talk is the Millihertz Gravitational Wave Observatory called LISA. LISA stands for the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. This is a mission that the European Space Agency and NASA are building for launch in the mid 2030s. So in brief, LISA is actually three spacecraft flying in formation with the two and a half million kilometer separation between the spacecraft. The spacecraft relay lasers back and forth between free floating test masses that are inside the spacecraft and combine the beams with interferometers. A passing gravitational wave will cause the test masses to um, shift slightly with respect to each other, you know, causing them to ride the gravitational wave with a certain amplitude and frequency. So what will LISA detect? Well, the standard plot for this is a gravitational wave strain, which I show on the y-axis, versus frequency on the x-axis plot, like this. Now, in this plot, the overall envelope of this dashed line reflects the sensitivity of the synchronous noise floor of the instrument. On the left, you're designed by, or constrained by the test mass acceleration noise, the peak sensitivity at the bottom here, that's set by the arm length, and on the right, uh, displacement noise. Above this curve is what Lisa did, will detect. And these various um, bands and dots are representing different source classes of things that Lisa should detect. So starting at the top, you see the bands illustrate where merging pairs of 10 to the seventh, 10 to the sixth, or 10 to the five solar mass black holes will appear from a year to an hour before merging. LISA is sensitive to such black hole mergers out to the edge of the observable universe, you know, retch of the 20. The orange curves at the bottom represents uh, more exotic classes of mergers, extreme mass ratio and spirals. And interestingly, these straight lines on the right represent stellar mass black hole mergers, LIGO sources that actually pass through the LISA band months to years before entering and merging in the LIGO band paths. But what interests me the most is the big cloud of blue dots in the middle of this plot. And these represent compact stellar binaries in the Milky Way. So binaries are abundant. Extrapolating from known populations, millions are expected to be emitting in the LISA band. Now the majority will not be individually resolved by LISA but will instead blend together to form sort of a source confusion limited foreground, which is represented by this gray bump at the bottom. The overall shape and strength of that bump measures the integrated binary population of the galaxy. However, LISA is expected to measure the loudest or individually resolve the loudest 10,000 binaries in the galaxy. And we already know about some of them. That's what these blue asterisks mark. These are what are referred to as verification binaries, binaries that we know now that LISA will detect. And these objects are double white dwarf binaries. Perhaps something, uh, estimates are something like uh, 10 to 100 binaries with neutron star or black hole components will also be detected. But the majority of these sources should be double white dwarfs. And that's important because white dwarfs emit light. We can observe them. So let me transition to the observations I'm making of white dwarfs and white dwarf binaries. So a well, white dwarf, as you probably know, are a star remnant. When stars cease fusion at the end of their lives, there's no more support against gravity in their cores. And for every star less massive than about eight times the mass of the sun, which is about 98% of all stars in the universe, the cores collapse to an electron degenerate object called a white dwarf. And white dwarfs pack the mass of the sun into a uh, volume of the size of the Earth. So they're compact objects and can fit in fairly small orbits. And in truth, single white dwarfs are kind of boring. They just fade and cool as time. But most stars are in binaries or higher order multiple systems. 
And that opens the door to some interesting outcomes. So our observational project, which we called the ELM survey, uh, began with some unexpected white dwarfs in my hypervelocity star program. These are white dwarfs that should not have been in the sample. My, uh, my colleague, Michael McKillick, understood that these were unusually low mass white dwarfs. And realizing they were interesting, together we designed a survey to find more of them. We called it the ELM survey because these were extremely low mass white dwarfs. And to my sort of surprise and chagrin, this name is stuck. It's almost become a name for a class of object now. Um, it was just the name of the survey. But physically, an extremely low mass white dwarf is the helium core white dwarf, a couple tenths of the solar mass in, in, in mass. These are the remnants of stars that never ignited helium in their cores. But what's notable about, about these objects is that white dwarfs below about a quarter of a solar mass are not found in traditional white dwarf surveys. To make that point, what I'm plotting here is the mass distribution of hydrogen atmosphere white dwarfs from the Gaia 100 parsec sample. You can see that most white dwarfs have a mass where you expect around 0.6 solar masses with a secondary bump at higher mass. And the median white dwarf in the ELM survey is 0.18 solar masses, you know, basically down where this plot goes to zero. The universe isn't old enough to make such a low mass white dwarf through single star evolution. Binary evolution is required. And that's what makes the low mass white dwarfs interesting. They're the signpost of a compact binary, exactly the type of system that Lisa may one day detect. So how do we detect them? Well, being degenerate objects, low mass white dwarfs have a distinctive radii. They're actually larger than a normal white dwarf, but smaller, of course, than a main sequence star. And so they're sort of easy to find if you look for them. In brief, our original target selection was actually based on colors using Sloan. This is how we did it. This plot is a color color diagram showing you every star in Sloan with this particular set of colors. G minus R on the x-axis reflects the temperature of these stars. And the big cloud dots at the bottom are spectral A-type stars. Stars whose spectrum are dominated by the hydrogen polymer lines. U minus G color on the y-axis uh, spans the Balmer decrement in the spectrum. And it reflects the gravity of the star at these temperatures. So the cloud of dots at the top of the plot are DA type white dwarfs, white dwarfs of the same temperature, but much uh, higher gravity. And the low mass white dwarfs fall in between. These magenta lines show where a pure hydrogen atmosphere object with a log G of five, six, or seven should fall in this diagram. Our approach was to obtain a spectrum for every star in Sloan in these two color selection regions. We started with the high velocity star survey, which by accident is a great way of finding low mass white dwarfs. And then we designed a dedicated survey to find more of them at cooler temperatures. And it worked. Over the last decade, we've found and published over 100 double white dwarf binaries with periods less than a day. Turns out that's more than half of all known detached double white dwarfs in the galaxy. For the following the re release of Gaia, we can now use parallax, or in this case, luminosity here, effectively in the same way, looking for the distinctive luminosity versus color of a low mass white dwarf. This now allows us to access the entire sky, including the southern sky. So our primary tool to date has been the MMT telescope. This is a figure shows kind of what the data looks like. And it turns out the blue channel spectrograph provides a somewhat unique capability on an eight meter class telescope. The ability to rapidly obtain spectra for hot blue stars, widely spaced on the sky. So the, we always start with an exploratory spectrum. Um, so the plot on the left shows you the near UV part of the spectrum, which is dominated by hydrogen Balmer lines, as I said before. That's in black. We then fit stellar atmosphere models, seeing this red line, 
to measure the temperature and gravity of the star. The high order Balmer lines are quite gravity sensitive. From that, we can drive a white dwarf mass if we adopt a mass radius relation or if we have a Gaia parallax now. It turns out those values are in perfect agreement, except for some of the coolest objects. So if the target is a low mass white dwarf, as we want to find, then we followed up with time series spectroscopy. So the plot on the right shows perhaps an extreme example, but this is our 12 minute period binary J0651, which you can see changes its velocity by 1,300 kilometers per second, you know, negative, positive, negative, positive every six minutes. So the time series spectroscopy allows us to measure directly the orbital velocity and um, or velocity amplitude and the orbital period, the binary. So what are we learning? Well, the observations allow us to constrain a number of things. The three things I'll sort of talk about here are the formation pathways of these binaries, the companion mass distribution, and what we think is the outcome, the evolutionary outcome of these binaries. So first, a word on stellar evolution. The radii of stars change with time, especially when they enter the giant bridge. For stars and binaries, this means the star can fill its Roche lobe, the gravitational effort potential between the two stars, and interact with its companion, sort of visualized in this graphic. The different possible outcomes of this process are numerous, and many of the pathways can bifurcate for physical reasons. One important parameter is actually what stage of evolution a star feels, you know, when the star first feels its Roche lobe. If this occurs at the end of the main sequence, the star's evolution is truncated very early, and the mass transfer channel can be stable for our class of objects, which leaves you with a very low mass white dwarf whose mass correlates with the period of the binary. If instead this occurs at the base of the red giant branch, then the mass transfer can be unstable for our class of objects. And given the energy required to eject the common envelope, uh, the result is a more massive white dwarf and left off in a shorter period binary. The diagnostic observables are the white dwarf mass and period of the binary, because mass and period should be correlated. So this plot shows the distribution of low mass white dwarf we were observing versus the period of the binary for our whole sample as of a couple of years ago. Now in this plot, the white dwarf's below about 0.3 solar mass. Uh, this part of the plot should be complete given our select selection criteria. And so we consider the bottom part of the plot our clean sample of extremely low mass white dwarfs. The blue dots are the ones that have disk kinematics and the red dots are the ones that have halo kinematics. And they overlap pretty much one to one. And it's worth pointing out that over a third of our sample actually belongs to the halo. Uh, the green dots in this plot are other white dwarf binaries we measured, uh, but we don't really have a complete sample for them. And formally, the error bars on this plot are smaller than the symbol size, except for the objects with open, drawn by open symbols. These are ones that have period aliases in the data. So the period may be wrong in some cases. So as first pointed out by Lee et al, this diagonal band of dots at the bottom of the plot is exactly the signature you'd expect from stable Roche lobe formation channel for these low mass white dwarf binaries. Interestingly, we also see this, this vertical band of objects between about 0.2 and 0.3 solar masses of objects only seen at very short periods, less than hour orbital periods. And this is the signature of the unstable common envelope channel. So the observations show evidence for both formation channels. Once formed, all of these binary orbits shrink due to gravitational wave radiation. To talk about what they turn back into, we first need to constrain the unseen secondaries in these binaries. So because we target objects dominated with light of a low mass white dwarf, how our target selection worked. What we find by construction are single line spectroscopic binaries. 
And that means we can only constrain the binary mass ratio given an inclination. So in this figure, I plot the full distribution of velocity semi-amplitude versus orbital period, but this time on a log scale so you can better see the short periods. Uh, the symbols are the same as before. The blue and red points are disk and halo objects in our clean sample, and the green objects are other white four binaries. The dashed and dotted lines in this plot are just meant to be a guide to give you a sense of the approximate companion mass and merger time for these objects, assuming a fixed white dwarf mass and a 60 degree inclination. So under that assumption, you can see the companions range from something like 0.1 to one solar mass, but we can do better than that. For the shortest period system, many of these are eclipsing or have ellipsoidal variation, and we have a direct constraint on their inclination. We know what the secondary mass is. For the rest of the sample, we have an indirect constraint. We selected these stars by color. Their inclination should be random. So using these constraints, we and others have derived statistically the companion mass distribution. And the answer is that it's a normal distribution with a mean of about three quarters of the solar mass. So that means a few things. First, the companions must be other compact objects to fit inside these binaries. Very likely normal carbon oxygen, oxygen white dwarfs. Second, the total mass of these helium plus CO white dwarf binaries is about a solar mass. So these are unlikely to be supernova progenitors. Uh, third, the mass ratio of these binaries is something like about one to three or so. And that has implications for the outcome of the binary mergers. So as I said before, the gravitational wave radiation drives the white force together. The, the, or, the orbits shrink with time. And whether the binaries turn back into an unstable or a stable mass transfer system depends primarily on the mass ratio of the two components. So what I plot here is the mass of the observed low mass white dwarf on the y-axis. Because it's larger in radius, it's always the donor star. Versus on the x-axis, the mass of the secondary, which is always the accretor in our systems. Now, we, because we don't measure the secondary mass in most cases, the dots here are just Monte Carlo draws from our clean sample, given the measurements, their errors, and any inclination. Constraint. And you can see, for example, the eclipsing binary J0651 makes a nice tight little cloud in this plot. Other objects are less well constrained. The mass transfer stability lines come from a paper from Marsh et al. 2004. And on the left, this blue line is the one to one mass ratio line. Objects with this mass ratio should always undergo unstable mass transfer. Essentially, the two objects come together and merge directly. On the far right, the red line is the one to four mass, one to four mass ratio line. Objects of these mass ratios should always enter stable mass transfer. And so they can essentially persist as long-lived stable mass transfer binaries. In our case, AMCBN systems. Interestingly, most of our sample falls in between these lines. And so determining the outcome of these binaries requires that we have additional information, like the direct constraint on the secondary mass. Well, until we have the gravitational wave measurements, we can measure the masses. We can take a different approach to answering this question. We can estimate the merger rate of these binaries we observe and compare that to the formation rate of the different possible outcomes. So before I get there, let me address at least two timescales that are relevant to this problem. First is the timescale over which we're detecting these low mass white dwarfs in our survey. We call this t -Ogs. So white dwarfs fade and cool with time. And to illustrate, I plot here the radius, luminosity, temperature, and gravity 
for uh, one of the low mass white dwarf tracks from the Luna Stratrace models. And this particular track satisfies our color selection criteria for about one UV year. Higher mass white dwarfs cool faster, and so it would be detectable in our survey for shorter amounts of time. So the T obs for our sample ranges from about 0.1 to 1 gig years. That's the snapshot in time over which we're sampling the white dwarf binary distribution. The second, second time scale to address is the gravitational wave merge time scale, which I just called here T merge. This time scale depends strongly on the orbit period. The chirp masses of these systems are all about the same. Now, interestingly, the observed period distribution is log normal, as seen on the plot on the right. Uh, what you're seeing here is a histogram of the periods of binaries on a log scale. On the top is, well, top is a histogram, the bottom is a cumulative distribution. And the green line is a normal distribution that fits the data very well. The median period here is six hours. And for our mass of systems, that corresponds to a gravitational wave merger time of 10 gig years, which is actually a little puzzling when you think about it. So systems at short periods merge very quickly. They disappear. The systems at long periods stay around forever. And so they can only accumulate over time. To match this observed sort of one-to-one -one ratio of rapidly merging into accumulating binaries, you actually have to form and merge a lot of short period binaries over the last big year to get this distribution. So forward modeling different distributions and comparing to the data, we infer a merger rate of helium plus CO white dwarf binaries about two times to the minus three per year in the disk of the Milky Way. The true rate can only be larger because we're not observing all helium plus CO white dwarf binaries. And so what do we compare against? What can these things become? Well, in a nutshell, there's three possibilities. The pair of white dwarfs could merge into a single object, they could explode, or they could persist as a long-lived stable mass transfer binary. In this case, like a uh, helium mass transfer binary is called an AMCBN. So observations of AMCBN systems in the Sloan survey, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, infer a formation rate of about one times 10 to the minus four per year. It's a factor of 20 times lower. If instead you detonate a couple tenths of the solar mass of uh, helium on a CO white dwarf, arguably it should look like an underluminous supernova. And I don't want to quibble about the various exact flavors of this, but the, the rate for these underluminous objects is something like one times to the minus four per year in this paper from Ryan Foley. So again, lower than the rate that we were observing. And finally, there's our Corona Borealis stars. These are unusually strange extreme helium stars. They're thought to be the merger product of a helium and CO white dwarf. Their estimated formation rate in the Milky Way is three times to the minus three per year. So very similar to our estimate. So of course, these rates are fraught with uncertainties of factors of few. But the relative comparison with the AMCDNs in particular is actually fairly robust because in this case, our samples come from the identical footprint on the sky, the Sloan footprint, and we use the same galactic scaling parameters as Carter et al, just for a clean comparison. So the upshot is that the low mass white dwarf, low mass white dwarf binaries we observe merging can explain all the AMCBNs in the galaxy, but the majority must become something else. So on the basis of these rates, it appears that most of the white dwarf binaries we're observing will simply merge into single objects, our core Bohr stars. Yeah, yeah, the, the outcome is unstable mass transfer. And this process makes for great gravitational wave sources. So let's bring the discussion back around to gravitational waves. This plot here shows the characteristic strain versus gravitational wave frequency for all the white dwarf binaries in the ELM survey, including the ones we haven't yet published, uh, a few more. The black line is the LISA four-year sensitivity curve, that's its nominal mission lifetime. 
And most of our objects fall below the sensitivity curve, sensitivity curve as, as expected. But eight of the systems should be individually resolved by Lisa. For comparison, by my count, there's about another 21 binaries currently known that Lisa will detect. Most of them are mass transfer binaries, AMCBNs. Our 12 minute period binary, the TO6 type 1, remains one of the D signature detached verification binaries. This is an object that Lisa will detect almost immediately upon turning on. And after four years, it should detect it as sinks noise about 150. So while the gravitational wave community always calls our objects verification binaries, it turns out the optical measurements are critical for their understanding. So a gravitational wave observatory like LISA continuously monitors the entire sky. To illustrate what that might look like, this figure from Lambert's et al shows what LISA would see for a model galactic binary population of double white dwarfs. The ellipses here represent the LISA's one sigma positional constraint for each of the sources. And the best localized binaries have uncertainties around one square degree. Optical positions are literally a million times better. Which is interesting because Shaw and Elements have shown that simply knowing the star, the binary's position, gives you information that can improve the derived gravitational wave parameters you can get from LISA by about a factor of two. Most of the binaries will also appear as constant frequency sources to LISA. That is, LISA won't resolve their orbital frequency change during its mission lifetime. And that's important for the gravitational wave parameter. Shaw and Elements have shown that having an independent inclination and period change measurement, such as from optical eclipse timing, can improve your gravitational wave parameter estimates by a factor of 40. And it goes the other direction too, of course. A uh, recent paper by Littenberg and Cornish have shown that gravitational wave measurements for a new verifi verification binary, J1539, would improve its optical parameter uncertainties by a factor of 5 to 10. So the point is, the combination of light and gravitational waves can provide much better physical constraints beyond what either light or gravitational waves can do alone. And this opens the door to new opportunities. So for example, in detached white dwarf binaries, tidal theory predicts a 10% enhancement to the binary orbital decay rate because theoretically, white dwarfs should tidally heat up as they come into merger. No one has ever measured that, but this has implications for the outcomes. So to illustrate the observational problem, I present here the eclipse timing for J0651, our 12 minute period binary. So the plot on the upper left shows its light curve, which comes from stacking time series photometry at the orbital period of the binary. And what you can see here are sort of three dramatic features. Uh, the sinusoidal um, shape here is, comes from ellipsoidal variation from a highly distorted white dwarf. Um, you can also see Doppler boosting, the asymmetry in the peaks, high, low, high, low in the light curve. And of course, the periodic dips in light due to eclipse from the primary and secondary white dwarf in the system. Interestingly, the time at which these features appear changes with time as the orbit shrinks. And you can see this visually in this plot on the right of observed minus computed time of eclipse versus year of observation. The plot shows a six year period. And by now, the time, the time uh, of clips have shifted by about 10 minutes. So this is not a subtle effect. And indeed, this Wiki Transient Factory group finds they have to include a P dot term to even identify the shortest period white for binaries uh, when using their light curves. So in the case of JO6I1, our eclipse timing allows us to measure its period change, its P dot here to accuracy of a 10th of a percent. And it looks like the period change is faster than the general relativistic prediction, which is drawn by this gray line in this plot. But 
The difference is not significant because we don't know the mass is well enough in the system from the optical measurements. The gravitational wave measurements will solve that. And as I note here in this factoid at the bottom, this binary is actually an order mansion more luminous in gravitational waves than in light. We're really using the wrong technique to observe it. Uh, let me add that gravitational wave measurements are also interesting for the mass transfer binaries. In those cases, the orbital change is actually dominated by the mass transfer, not general relativity. And Brevik have all have shown how joint gravitational wave and light observations can allow you to break down the period change into the GR and mass transfer components and constrain the stability of mass transfer, possibly shedding light on AMCBNs as supernova progenitors. So looking to the future, there's currently um, 29 Lisa verifications by my count. I might be missing something, I don't know. Um, I made a plot here of, that shows their position on the sky in galactic coordinates. So we in the ZTF team have each discovered eight detached white refineries that are LISA sources marked by the blue and red diamonds. And the other half the sample are AMCDNs, the mass transfer binaries marked by green dots. And the distribution on this plot reflects where people have looked, which is mostly high latitude surveys. If instead you overlay the Gaia image sort of to scale, uh, there's clearly more systems to be found, particularly in the plane of the Milky Way, where most of the stars are. And indeed, models estimate that if you mine the Gaia catalog, there's every reason to believe you can grow the sample to 100 LISA verification binaries, which becomes a, actually a useful size for doing population and other studies. Models also uh, predict that LSST will contain light curves for about a thousand LISA binaries. This greater reach allows you to detect uh, in order of magnitude more systems. But that's still a factor of 10 below the number of binaries that LISA is expected to individually resolve. And the reason is that gravitational waves can easily see binaries, such as every binary in the far side of the galaxy, that light-based observations have no hope of detecting. But that's okay because the most interesting binaries are the brightest and nearest objects, the ones that we can really characterize well with all of our techniques. And it's important that we start now because period change measurements for some of these objects can take a decade. So that's all I had. In conclusion, white millihertz gravitational wave observations are coming. The combination of light and gravitational waves promise to improve our understanding of a number of phenomena. And white dwarf binaries turn out to be among the best multi-messenger laboratories of the future, objects that we can see with both light and gravitational waves. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. That's really great. While uh, the audience figures out uh, whether or not they want to ask, answer, ask a question, um, I thought I would ask the first one. Um, you have, you, you found a lot of these and you can connect them to um, our core Bohr stars and AMCBNs and, and possibly some supernovae. Have you tried to connect them to the progenitors? Uh, you know, what kind of binaries, you know, make these and can you identify them nearby? And if you can, can you see one of these get formed uh, nearby? Yeah, I haven't gone that far. So the binary population synthesis models model the pathways. And I don't believe you know, the target, the things we're targeting is sort of 10, 20,000 Kelvin. So they've already, these are things that have gone through their common envelope phase and, and detached to the detached white dwarf binaries that we observed sort of like a gig year ago, you know. Um, so yeah, I don't, I guess the short answer is I don't know what they would look like um, in that common envelope phase. Presumably some sort of, you know, yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay. I see Tony has a question, so. Okay, go ahead. There are none in the chat. Um, yeah, so my question is, I 
I don't understand why Lisa is a triangle instead of a simplex. You would think that if with, with four uh, modules, they could get the other dimension and they wouldn't just be looking at uh, waves in that plane and the, and the uh, accuracy of positioning uh, would be that much better and it wouldn't be all that much more expensive. I think the short answer is money. They actually wanted to make the arm length much longer, um, which would make it more sensitive, but that was too costly. Um, so, uh, and they do, so for the constant frequency sources like our white dwarf binaries, uh, the LISA orbits the sun, right, once a year. And so it actually gets the full phase coverage um, for constant frequency sources. It's more of an issue for the merging black holes where you really capture it at a moment, right? Um, but there are those distinction noise ratios is much higher. And so you, you, you do better there, I think, for those, odd, those sources. Um, a lot of the localization is very since noise dependent. Uh, Igor. With another hand. <laughs> Hi, Warren. Uh, nice talk. I, I just hope that th these systems won't be the only thing that Lisa will see. Uh, so my question is the following. Uh, do you have any clear cases where you see the double lines in the optical spectra? Because it might be very interesting. Yes, uh, I remember are, that uh, I looked at some of yours, uh, some of your spectra, but one of the components was much fainter than the other one, so it was impossible to get it out. Yes, there are examples of double line white dwarf binaries. The problem is the because they have such high gravities, the Balmer lines are enormously wide, and so you have to go to like a. It turns out the H alpha line core has a narrow, uh, very narrow core that you can use to disentangle double lines white four finer, and there are such known systems, but it's around a dozen or so, maybe 20 at most. So there's not that many double white, uh, double line systems. Yeah, for our sample, there's clearly in a couple objects where we know they're double line, but we can't see it. So, you know, you can't really constrain it or you can't measure it with our current measurements. Okay, thanks. There's a question in the chat, by the way. I don't have the chat up. Okay, I will. I just saw that come up. Yes. So Ray, the, so the, I'll read it out. Ray, this is from Kareem Julian El Badri to everyone. Ray, Ray, the question about progenitors EOMs. We found some of the ones currently forming by a stable mass transfer, and he has an archive link. Thank you. Sorry, yes. that was just a question, a response to your question, uh, the first one that. Seems like the ones that form by, by a stable mass transfer look like cataclysmic variables early on and then evolve to hotter temperatures. Yeah, so thank you, Kareem. You, so he just published a very fine thesis paper on the pre ELM, uh, the pre extremely low mass white force. In this, and uh, yeah, it's a very nice uh, result that shows um, what you know, what these things look like before they reach the sort of cooling track side, which is where we are targeting mostly. Other questions? Uh, Jennifer, go ahead. I was wondering, um, what's the timeline for Lisa? Uh, it's ambiguous, Twenty mid 2030s. I think originally it was I don't know when, when exactly it was supposed to be 2034 or something, but now I think ESA wants to launch it simultaneously with a, uh, with Athena. It's the, the other one that's timed for that same time slot. They, they think there's synergy to having both missions up at the same time. Um, uh, so that's mid 2030s is the answer. I mean, both, both uh, space agencies are committed to the project at this point. So they're building, you know, they're prototyping and building hardware and going through their various phases. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it looks like it's going to happen, but it's it's a ways away. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I should add. So it's a European Space Agency led mission. NASA is the junior partner on it, so it's really European Space Agency that sets the um, the timing on this one. Uh, Brandon. 
Yes, hi. Uh, yeah, sorry, this is this is probably a very basic question, but what sort of angular resolution is achievable with Lisa as of today, or at least you know the best uh, the best estimate you might have for that? Uh, so it's, it's what I said. The best localized sources, the galactic binaries, will be about about a square degree. Um, it's very sense and noise dependent. It's almost entertaining as you go to lower sense to noise. You can have multiple peaks on the sky, right? There's some degeneracies, um, kind of what Tony was mentioning. If you just measure in one plane, it's you can have localizations and opposite side of the sky or something. Um, but as you go to higher sense to noise, and particularly as you, if you measure the, the higher frequency derivatives, the p dot or the p and p double dots, right? As you get from the merging sources, that gives you a lot more information and it really helps localize um, the, the high sense to noise systems like the merging black hole binaries. So I believe for the best localized systems, they're talking about square arc minutes, but um, you know, the, I think the median Y4 binary will be a probably 100 square degree kind of uh, localization. Uh, Kareem, did you have your hand up for another question? Yeah, it was, it was related to the last question, but I, I was also just noticing the ellipses on the Lisa plot are pretty big in some cases. Um, will it usually be for the double white dwarf binaries? Will it usually be possible to unambiguously find based on those ellipses and optical colors what the white dwarf is? And, uh, or I, I guess I, I don't have a, a good sense of how sparse on the sky uh, things in, in that range of, of color space are once you go down to the limits of optical of optical surveys and Lisa? Yeah, it's a good question. And in fairness, no one has really modeled that. I've actually thought about it, but I haven't really dived into it in detail. Um, I think the first order, so most of the objects you can see visually are in the plane. And so any square degree on the plane must have a billion stars, right? It, it's hopeless to do it on position alone. But there's other information there. So if you have a, a frequency derivative, Lisa will measure the distance. Um, and so that means you can compare with the parallax distance. At least, you know, um, Gaia gives us an aftermetric uh, distance for a lot of objects. And so you have an additional constraint. Um, with LFST, it might be sparse sampling, but in principle, you have some estimate. You know what's a variable star and perhaps what uh, in variability aliases it has. And you can link the frequency that Lisa measures to uh, periodicity in a uh, light curve, whether it's ZTF or LSST. So I think you have to do a joint constraint to get from you know, a billion stars in square degree. And uh, my understanding from Kevin Burge, who's doing this work for the uh, Squakey Transient Factory, is that there's actually not that many short period variables in the sky, right? If you really look at the shortest periods, the ones you care about for Lisa, um, there's actually, it's, it's not a million, it's, I don't know, thousands or something, hundreds. It's, it's, it's a small-ish number, um, at least for their survey range. So it may not be as hopeless as we think it is, at least for the systems that have variability. Um, I'll keep going because I have the floor, but the, uh, there's actually an interesting twist to this. If you look at that gravitational wave strain formula, it turns out face on binaries have about a three times larger gravitational wave strain than edge on eclipsing you know, binaries. So the, ironically, the most, the strongest sources will be the ones you can't detect variability on. They'll be kind of in face on configurations. Um, the ones that we can easily measure with optically are eclipsing binaries, right? Uh, but those are actually a little bit weaker strain sources. Um, so it's, you know, there's different, ex different uh, aspects of this problem. Uh, JJ Hermes had a comment in the chat. Uh, why don't you just uh, say it, Jimmy? JJ? It was just about localization, that Lisa's frequency resolution, you, even for four years, won't be nearly as good as the orbital period constraints we have. So that'll also help with localization. But only for, only for the known systems, though. Yeah, I think for you know the astronomy side of the view of this is that there should there needs to be some careful thought in how you do the cross match right between the gravitational wave measurements and um, and the optical surveys. Right, we have in, in many cases we have much more information than the gravitational wave side, but they'll detect binaries that we can't detect. So the, the trick is making the connections. Any other final questions, comments? 
it seems not. So thanks very much, Warren, and thanks everyone for attending. I don't know if Lars has any announcements for next week, but uh, let's all thank uh, Warren virtually, if, if not uh, at home, um, before uh, we hear any comments that Lars might make. Thanks a lot, Warren. Bye, everyone. Uh, no, nothing for me. Thanks. Thanks a lot for a great talk, Warren. You're welcome. Thanks, Warren. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone, and uh, have a good evening.